Good afternoon. Welcome to this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet. Uh, very pleased to welcome. We got it now? Okay, this is better. Very pleased to welcome today Roslyn Layden, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and one of the world's leading experts on telecommunications policy. Uh, she is going to be speaking with us today about telecommunications policy and why is there resistance to modernizing the FCC? Uh, Rosalind, why don't you tell us a bit about um, uh, Bill Kennard, the great deregulator. He's going to be the hero of this talk, I think. And uh, about a Danish delegation that went to meet with Bill Kennard back in the 1990s. Exactly. <clears throat> well, I think it's. <clears throat> I think I want in my next uh, paper. I want to do something about the great Democrat deregulators because there were many Alfred Kahn, and, um, <clears throat> so there's quite a pedigree. So, <clears throat> you know, a little known story, and, and I, I have I've written this up in a paper for Mercatus uh, as well. And, and um, at any rate. The you know the, the the Danes were always looking to the United States, are very inspired by American success, um, but they were largely looking at their future being a small country, they have very strict immigration policy, but they wanted to be efficient, and um, they wanted to maintain high labor cost, and so they always knew that they had to um, be smarter with their use of the government resources. So there's a view in. In Denmark today, even though it's a <clears throat> highly regulated, a number of health, let's say the healthcare sector, telecommunications is largely deregulated. Um, and the the view is for a long, the understanding was that the government was not going to figure out how to do that; it had to be left to the market. And this was at the time in the 1990s a, uh, a left government, um, what we might call Democrats, if you will. But they went to meet with Bill Kennard, and he at the time had a plan for modernizing the FCC along the lines of the Federal Trade Commission. So with the Bureau of Economics, the Bureau of Competition, Bureau of Consumer Protection. But the idea of that was going back to a classic idea in telecom regulation, that <clears throat> the goal of telecom regulation is to get to a competitive market. If you have a monopoly, you need to, your regulation needs to proceed in a series of linear stages and eventually becomes competitive, and you remove the telecom regulation, and the general competition laws take over. So the Danes always had this idea that uh, they wanted to privatize their national telephone monopoly, which, you know, in fact, some American companies uh, in invested in, and they didn't want to have any t telecom authority anymore. They just wanted to have a very general uh, competition law in place, and they saw that as a very prudent, fiscally responsible way to manage the country because they can't hire a lot of bureaucrats. It's just expensive. So their view is the government needs to be lean and mean and deliver a high quality of service. So they, they met with Bill Kennard and um, put in a plan that they wanted the Danish uh, telecom market to be the best and cheapest in the world. And they do have some of the lowest prices for telecommunications. But this, uh, their implementation actually resulted to dismantling the telecom regulator. And they did it essentially overnight. They, the argument at the time uh, was Hella Torning Schmidt, the first female prime minister. She said, you know, we need to use these resources in cybersecurity. So they created an agency for cybersecurity. And they essentially repurposed the employees and the resources to um, the Ministry for Cybersecurity, Ministry for uh, Energy, and another for Ministry of Finance. And the world continued. It went on the next day. <clears throat> Three years later, Denmark won an award for the world's top digital nation by the International Telecommunications Union. And that's a measure of access, use, and skills in the society. And the country's always been at the top of that measure. But it's a very interesting view because it's quite opposite of many discussions that we need some kind of enlightened government thinking to deliver us a, a 
an efficient and comp competitive uh, telecom market. So, um, so in any case today, the, the Danes have had a, a very successful run. They managed net neutrality with uh, um, self-regulation for five years with a lot of success. There were no complaints. There were no um, violations. It worked very well. And uh, there's been a high amount of investment in the country. And it ranks in the top of the EU for, um, for uh, uh, digital solutions. Now, there was a role for the government to play in terms of the government has been very advanced in digitizing its own services. So in a small country, it is a large buyer of IT services. So it created, it stimulated a lot of demand for IT services because it digitized itself. It forced a lot of other businesses to get online. So for example, the banking industry outlawed checks 25, 30 years ago. So people have been forced to adopt digital solutions very quickly. About five years ago, all telephone calls to the county office were abolished. So you can't pick up your phone and call it. You have to send an email. So they forced the country to adopt digital solutions as a way to cut costs and drive efficiency. Um, so, so they've done a number of things that way. I mean, you know, it, they're still going, uh, still trying to make improvements. So for example, they'll now be on the they have a, it's kind of a dream that we used to have in the United States. They have a bipartisan telecom policy that they've had in place for 20 years. They're making a new bipartisan agreement. And their new policy looks at 5G, where all of the deployment for any kind of mobile wireless infrastructure, whether it's 4G or 5G, has to be fast tracked. And if there's any public ownership or public lands involved, it has to have only the minimum amount of rent. So um, you can't have situations where a public owner, let's say this, the city, will charge you a usurious rate to put up your tower or your mast or your small cell. So anything that is publicly owned has to be um, offered at a, at, a low, at a low rate. So that's quite a, a, forward, um, a forward development. But it's just interesting to see that you know, other countries could be inspired by you know, the plans that, that we didn't look at. So. Who in Denmark, is there a government agency that uh, is the deed of, the record keeper of deeds of wireless spectrum licenses? Right. Or? So the interesting part was the core of the, there's another interesting aspect of the story in that the, the bureaucrats who are working in the Danish government, they are highly respected, highly regarded, um, but they also consider themselves as Lego bricks so that they may have a set of skills that are transferable to other agencies. So they have a kind of view of broadband isn't everything, so maybe I need to work in transportation or maybe I work in education. I am not wedded to the telecom regulator for life. It might mean I have to move to another part of the country, but that's the sort of sense of the, the way they see themselves and their, the importance of their job, but they also have to be flexible given that the, the needs of the the polity and the government will change. I mean, it's such an amazing mindset that would say, wow, I'm, I'm a public servant, and I'm going to work in different places through my career. I'm not tied to you know, the Department of Labor to the end of time. You know? so, so, they, so in any case, the, um, there were a set of employees who worked in what was, the, what was the telecom regulator. And a number of them were created in a small section of the sort of Department of Commerce or the business ministry. And so they, they pro do a number of the telecom functions. But it shows you don't have to have a telecom regulator to do telecom regulation. So for example, there's a whole set of EU laws around telecommunications, which the Danes have to take as part of um, the EU agreement. But the, it's the Ministry of Energy which actually does the net neutrality compliance. So they have to do a report every year. They have to be able to receive complaints if there are any. Um, they have to, so that's done by <clears throat> a ministry that's looking at energy and climate. <clears throat> it's not to, so so it sort of shows that people have to know how to use their skills in public service in a number of different functions. And companies that, in American parlance, would be called edge providers, no. they don't have any problem in Denmark in terms of getting access to broadband right. services. So there's an interesting point. The um, uh, those policymakers who were 
in place when the transition happened. They wrote a, a number of long papers where, uh, in their mind, they, were, they didn't believe we needed special internet regulations because they said the market is becoming more competitive, not less. Users have much more options for communications. They have all kinds of substitutes. So they didn't believe that you needed to design the system so that it would support let's say, the edge provider's interests. And because they thought that it was already moving in their favor, they didn't have to make it even easier for them, if you will. Well, let's, let's review how 20 years ago, the United States and Denmark were probably in the same regulatory system and how the paths have diverged. Um, so in the United States, we... Uh, we continue to to regulate and to have the FCC pretty much structured as it was 20 years ago or 80 years ago or you know, however, however long ago you want to look. Um, tell us about Bill Kennard's vision and what happened to it. Right. So I think that um, that was in the time there was a, a, a burgeoning of this school of new public management, if anybody remembers that. But it was a sort of, it was the time about citizens are customers, you know, for government services. And there was a need for the government to be accountable, to be efficient. Um, if you might remember, you know, Bill Clinton and Al Gore smashing the toilet seat that was so expensive, you know, they, they did a lot to try to popularize this idea about, you know, government needs to be Accountable. It should, if it's going to deliver the service, it needs to be, um, you know, done well, high quality, um, no waste. And so I think that Bill uh, Bill Kennard's plan was very much in that ethos, that you should always be evolving your agency. You know, provi provi I understand there are some statutory requirements, but you should always be looking to whatever your service that you're doing, whatever that you're performing for the citizens. You need to do it more efficiently. And if there's a better way to do it, you should, you should do it. And, and this is not an unusual idea. Anybody in nonprofits or in business, we all know we have to reinvent ourselves all the time. And this was in vogue in the, in the 90s in, in government as well. And um, so he did propose this notion for the F FCC. Um, it didn't take hold. So I mean, you, you can also remember there was a lot going on with the mergers. And we can also have a discussion around, was it really appropriate for the FCC to be reviewing mergers the way that, as if they were their own DOJ or, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so so that was, was, was an issue. But there's certainly a lot of p parties in the, in the Beltway who wouldn't, would not like the FCC to be reformed because their livelihood is probably predicated on it staying the same. So look where we are today. We spend about $10 billion a year just in reporting to the FCC. You know, Office of Management Budget estimates $800 million just in reporting costs and 73 million hours annually. It's a staggering number. That's larger than our disbursements of the Universal Service Fund every year. That's just in the cost of regulated companies complying with FCC. So. I'm sure that you know someone like Bill Conard would even look at that and say, that's not a great use of our time here. We actually can be a great party and help people. A lot of other ways we could use that money could be investing in rural areas, um, could be used to uh, try new technologies, a number of things. So, um, But in any case, his plan didn't take off. And as I understand, it wasn't popular with a number of law firms because they, they thought that their billings would be reduced. Um, but you might argue if you move to a pure competition framework, you might still have the same billings, if not more, because I, I would wager that a number of things don't get litigated today because um, you don't use a competition law standard, that there might be even more opportunities for law firms to make money if, under an FTC framework. Um, but, but there's no doubt that because economics has not been a part of what the FCC does, that they make a lot of rules which are not justified by the, you know, that aren't, aren't justified by the, by the economics that they're claiming. Let's develop the historical background before we get to 
new economics at the FCC. But just one quick little point. In Denmark, are there lots of reporting requirements? Do broadcasters have to file all kinds of paperwork with the Danish government? Well, so the reporting is a great question. Just to put it in a, I like to, you know, I live there for much of the year, and we don't have tax returns. It's such a seamless, frictionless society that so much is digitized. There's no, you don't have to go through the end of the year and submit a tax return because all of the payments are cashless. All the activity that people are doing is integrated with the system and, and so forth. Now, that might concern some people, but it's a small enough society. There's a lot of trust and transparency. But in any case, the, it's not acceptable in the Danish framework that you're spending, um, you're spending so much time in, in reporting. Take a company like AT&T. They have 800 employees working in the policy function. And around the United, between federal and state, 800 people who have to do all the work to engage with the state regulators and so forth. And that would be unacceptable in Denmark. They just don't have, their companies are smaller. Any kind of a recurring thing has to be automatic. They would not have, you know, they would not accept that we, oh, we have just 10 people in this department are sending the reports to the regulator. It's, it's, it's just not there. They want to set up their business so that the information that the regulators need is automatically collected and um, to, to minimize the reporting requirements. That's not to say there's no reporting. But if you just think about that so much of the everyday work of telecom regulation is extremely labor intensive, very costly, um, something that could be designed to save a lot more money. And, you know, but that's, that's the choice that we're making with the model we have today. Now, there were a series of court cases uh, dealing with FCC jurisdiction over the internet and broadband uh, from uh, really from around 2000 to the present, city of Portland, Brand X. Could you tell us a bit about these cases and the development of the law around what authority the FCC has over the internet? Well, I think there's a, a number of good folks who can weigh in on the legal side of things. But, you know, I would say for as a, as a, a, a non-legal person, you know, it's, it's the real question here. <clears throat> well, let's say from the telecom regulatory perspective, what is the FCC, does it have the th authority to do what it's doing? And if you look at where we are today, all the, we're having these huge legal battles. And does it come back to this question? Did we, the people, ever authorize the FCC to regulate the internet? And if you read the '96 Act, we didn't. And um, but amazingly, you know, some lawyers look at that and say, "Well, of course you, of course you did." <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> and now look at what the state of California is doing um, in making uh, their own net neutrality rules even more extreme than um, what the FCC adopted. So, it's really uh, out of hand. Um, it's it shows that our 96 Act is certainly out of date, or that even if you say something very clear that the internet should be free and unfettered from um, state and, f and federal regulation, that that is not clear to some, some people. I guess it's what can stand up in a court of law. How, do, how would 50 different network neutrality laws at the state level operate? I don't think it would work. I mean, it's one of these sad things, I think, that some states will just put it on the books, and maybe they don't enforce it, and they just use it as a kind of virtue signaling or symbolic politics. Oh, you know, we protect the internet in our state. But it's really untenable, I mean, because we know that it's the internet is def transcending any state border. Um, it would be impossible to deliver a service, because even the <clears throat> Even a t telecom service will be taking into account vendors and, and uh, actors from all kinds of other places. So I would think even as a consumer, let's say you're in California, but you buy a prepaid service from a vendor who's located in another state, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, it's, it's totally unfathomable, but that is kind of the, the world we live in, that, um, that this is done as a, as a political theater 
as a way to um, uh, to demonstrate to a, a certain constituency, um, this is we're, we're doing this for you, and this is important. I don't know how you could implement that those kind of rules without massively violating people's privacy. And in fact, this is one of the problems we're seeing in the EU right now with the EU net neutrality rules, that they require a monitoring by the telecom regulators. It's so invasive because they they want to monitor all the traffic management techniques to make sure that the telecom providers are not doing anything wrong. So they want to set up constant um, uh, clients, which are a, a, a software client that's measuring the network. And that violates the European privacy rules because you're not supposed to have interference in your correspondence. The government is not to interfere. So <clears throat> it's, a, um, it's a terrible uh, uh, outcome of an unintended consequence of trying to protect the end users. You actually violate their privacy um, in order to prove that you're you know, doing your job as a regulator. Now, Rosalind, you're an economist, and uh, the FCC has written, I don't know how many rules over the years, lots of rules. Um, does the FCC routinely uh, have economists look at the costs and benefits of regulations that are written by the commission? Well, one would think that that would go on in a telecom regulator. <laughs> I, I think... Naively, one might think that. Yeah, and if you had 80 economists working in a in an agency, that at some point they may, um, you know, do some regressions or do some calculations. You would one would hope, um, but and and I think that you know that went on at the FCC for there was a heyday of of economist activity in the 1990s. I mean, um, do you probably recall an amazing work on doing spectrum auctions. Um, and publishing papers was, was a very exciting time. Um, but that sort of faded away. I mean, economists haven't published at the FCC, I think, for five years, something, five or six years. No paper has come out wow. at all. And I think it's very sad because there's a number of extremely talented economists who were there who've been essentially put in the broom closet. Um, they weren't allowed to participate in the um, major rulemaking, the Open Internet Order, as you probably know, it was called the Economics Free Zone by the chief economist at the time. But the <laughs> incredible underta undertakings are made, but with not without a regard to a regulatory impact assessment, cost-benefit analysis, cost-efficiency analysis. <clears throat> and um, you know, I think for a long time, the FCC had hit under this thing, well, we don't have to do it because we're an independent agency. and it's not required. And I think technically that's probably true. If, if that is that a position that you want to take, that you really don't care at all, that you wouldn't be interested to put the costs and benefits on the table. And I don't think that that would fly with Bill Kennard. You know, I think he, was, he did care about, okay. you know, that there was bene the benefits exceeded the cost. What about uh, Chairman Ajit Pai? What is his view about well, economics in the You know what, I, I think that uh, I give you and the Hudson Institute a lot of credit because April, almost a year ago, he sat here and made a proposal to create an Office of Economics and Data. It has since been established. It's called the Office of Economics and Analytics. And he proposed formalizing the function for economics inside the FCC. Um, it did happen in the past in a maybe a more uh, informal way. I mean, Michael Katz used to have a sort of informal stamp of approval. There couldn't be a rulemaking unless he looked at it. But there's a need to formalize um, the FCC process around how, the, how is data used for decision making. So there was a, after this announcement here at Hudson last April, um, there was a group of um, FCC staff who did a nine-month assessment about what are the problems today and how to resolve it? And they voted on the item in January, and it's now um, in process of being set up. So I, I think there's a 30-page report or so you can read on the, if you go to the FCC's uh, January meeting, you can see all the backup about that, what was the findings. Um, but they found, four, found out four very important things. One, that economics wasn't incorporated in the day-to-day -day activities, into the not just day-to-day, -day, but major decisions, 
or it came in too late or not in a systematic way, it was too ad hoc. They found that economists were too dis 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 disjointed or too distributed throughout the agency. They didn't have an appropriate way to it, it enter into the discussion. They couldn't crosswalk going in between the bureaus, for example. They also found that data was not easily accessible. So for example, it could be brought in with one agency, couldn't be shared with another, it wasn't in a format that could be accessible by everyone that needed it. That's really one of the common problems um, in organizations that um, they have a lot of outdated systems, they don't have a big picture view about how to organize. So they proposed a, a what they wanted, they, the, the idea is they'll overcome this challenge by centralizing the 80 or so economists in one place so that they have a community, they have a way to work together. This is also an important function that you can't do your rulemaking unless you will, if it's $100 million or more, it will need to be looked at by this particular, uh, by this office. And so it's kind of the economic conscience of the FCC in the same way as maybe the Office of uh, General Counsel is the legal conscience. But this is not a new idea. I mean, if we go to the Federal Trade Commission or the DOJ or the SEC or the EPA, they all have an Office of Economics. And so roughly about 80 to 100 people. And, and that's appropriate given the activity and the level. So we, we have models that show you can deliver a work product you know, that is the economic justification for your activities as a federal agency with that kind of a, a setup. So if I understand what you're saying there, lots of other agencies have such an office. Uh, and so um, uh, was there any resistance to this plan, to well, the modernizing <laughs> the FCC? So it's unfortunately so. I mean, um, well, in the vote in January, so it was a three to, three to two vote, which is was very disappointing to me, given that the idea of using data to make decisions or that any major decisions would have some kind of an analysis of cost and benefit. Or even you could say, look, here's a contentious issue. Here's three to five options about how we could address it. What's the relative merits of each? You know, that shouldn't be a controversial notion. Um, and you'd think that everybody would get on board because whenever you're not in power, you'll really be happy that there is an Office of Economics and Analytics because it's always the, it's in the minority's interest that you have a way to stop some politically driven effort or item. But um, two of uh, the Democratic commissioners voted, voted against it. Uh, now, it's interesting when you read the dissent. Um, Mignon Clyburn made an, she made a valid point. She said, well, why didn't you use economic analysis when you overturned the open internet order or on BDS? So that's an interesting point because technically the FCC doesn't have to. But remember, the 2015 order was implemented without evidence, so you could technically remove it without evidence. <laughs> um, you know, so, <clears throat> but in any case, some, um, I think you can look at the, the two years of the 2015 order and prior. There was a loss of investment. There was a loss of innovation. Um, we, we certainly saw uh, problems in decline in rollout of, of new technologies. So they did demonstrate the harm of that order. But in any case, her view was that such an office would only be selectively used and that you can weaponize economics, if you will. Now, I don't deny that that can, can happen. But on the other hand, if you look at the, the framework for regulatory impact assessment that's presented by OMB, um, it's quite detailed. It's very difficult to, if you use that faithfully, it is very difficult to how would you say, shoehorn um, an economics-free kind of order. I mean, that is designed to capture um, social values, existence values, all kinds of maybe intangible uh, valuations that wouldn't necessarily be caught in price. And so there's, we have a lot of tools today. I mean, economics is a rich discipline. We've worked with environmental economics now for more than a generation around how do we value the environment, things we might never see and touch in the rainforest. There are ways to put economic valuation on that. The same with telecom policy. So in any case, so that was her complaint that um, uh, she felt it was selective. Now the standard, at least as I understand, is if you're 100 million 
if the, any item action that's 100 million or more would need to get this review. Now, <clears throat> on the case of um, Jessica Rosenworcel, her view, she did recognize the value of economics and that it's important. Um, in her case, she didn't feel that there was enough transparency in the creation of the office. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure if, you know, if you can read for yourself the 30 pages. It lists all the interviews, all the people who weighed in, the various rationale, the proposed design. Um, it doesn't give a list, because I think the idea is you'll take existing staff and move them into this office. So the distributed economists will move to one office leaving one economist to work within each major bureau. So, but in Jessica's case, that wasn't transparent. Um, you know, I, I think that it was hard to know, you know, you couldn't have put forth exactly who would move before you actually vote on the item. But in any case, <clears throat> it's, what I think is underlying is that there's a number of policies that people want which are not justified by the technical requirement. They're not justified by the economics. And we can certainly see on Title II that it's highly emotional. Um, there are major, there are many economic papers. They were absolutely disregarded in the process of doing the 2015 rules. So if, in fact, you gave it to due diligence, you wouldn't have been able to come to the conclusion that Title II reclassifying the internet as a utility was justified. Now, they would say, well, we had to do that to make the court happy. but. The economics would tell you, if you make a fiat uh, decision that there's no two-sided market, that um, there's an open-ended general conduct standard, you know, all the things, all the bright line rules and so on, they don't pass muster in an honest economic analysis. Because then you would at least say, OK, well, if you're going to adopt this, uh, you know, you're going to adopt a no blocking rule, well, then the, the downside is this. Because you'd at least have to give the other side of the story. And, if you had had that discussion, I don't think that it would be so easy to have the binary outcome where we are now. Because at least we'd say, all right, well, I'm going to give up as a consumer my ability to have a lesser price broadband experience. You know, I'm giving up the ability, we're giving up $30 billion a year in, let's say, edge providers helping to subsidize the cost of the infrastructure. I mean, that's a trade off. And that wasn't transparent in the, the 2015 order. Well, I could just stay here all afternoon asking you questions, and that wouldn't be fair to you and wouldn't be fair to the audience who probably have a lot of questions themselves. So I'm going to open up the floor, and I'm going to intersperse some of my own questions. Please identify yourselves. Uh, we have people handy, uh, with microphones, and uh, Mr. Ed, one in the back corner, has the first question. Well, thank you, and I hope it's not too far afield from where we've been, but it does fit into uh, what the FCC does need to be doing or does not need to be doing. In that vein, uh, is there a justification for having both the CFIUS uh, process for foreign intended mergers with U.S. companies and having Team Telecom, which is run by the FCC, uh, getting the views of the various defense-minded departments and agencies, doing the same thing in effect as what CFIUS does uh, couldn't CFIUS be doing that for all industries, including telecom, in a national security sense? Do you want to take a stab first? Or? Why don't you take the first stab? <laughs> so, well, presently, I think the way we, just in general, um, the way we do mergers, I think, is extremely costly. It's uh, redundant. It takes too much time. I mean, that telecom mergers have a triplicate review, just depending if there's a license to be transferred. I think it's arbitrary. You know, you have DOJ, FTC, then FCC, and the FCC can nix the thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's so um, prone to ca being captured. And we can see, you know, we, we can see the kind of the way the mergers were done in the last decade where, you know, there's no problem about a big merger. You can just get a bigger Christmas tree and put on all kinds of conditions which are immune from judicial review. And, so, I mean, this, what I, what I think is going back to this idea, because we're just talking about the data, about FCC using data. But look at how the whole merger process has been abused by the FCC. That this is a way for whatever party in power makes its own policy. 
So it doesn't have to take the effort to go to Congress and say, well, can you please make the rules and we have to go through a democratic process. It can simply take the largest merger in front of it, say, well, we want you to comply with these requirements. You must sell products at this price. They must be served in this place. You must make donations here and here, and then you have your merger. And it's a tremendous abuse. Um, but that is just too attractive for you know, whatever political party would love to have this open-ended public interest standard you know, to, to get his policy done. Now, I understand from their perspective, great. It's, it's uh, expedient. Um, it's open-ended. It's creative. It's innovative from that way. But for those of us, I'm sorry, the, the fuddy-duddies here who we care about rule of law and you know, accountability, it's not, it's, it, it, it's not good. Now, um, you know, but this just goes to show, look at, the, look at how powerful the FCC is. We're just talking about trying to bring in a simple cost and benefit analysis. We haven't even talked about the area of, you know, are the merger reviews appropriate? Are they, you know, accountable? Is it, you know, is it, is it fair, is it right that it's not subject to judicial review? I mean, I'd love to hear what you think, Carol. Now, building on what you were saying, Rosalind, uh, look, CFIUS is, uh, it's in part statutory, it's in part executive order. It, it's, it, it's a lawful, Process chaired by the Deputy uh, Secretary of Treasury, uh, with more than a dozen agencies participating in it. Um, the FCC's merger review is not statutory. <coughs> Some would say it's not lawful, uh, and, and any kind of organization that's built up around it is also, by definition, not statutory and not directly by regulation anyway. Um, having said that, what has ha happened over the past 20 years across all administrations is CFIUS really until, really until the past couple of weeks has been uh, uh, a, a rather uh, passive, passive process, shall we say. Um, and uh, so the FCC has kind of stepped in to uh, at least get the views of uh, some of the agencies with national security concerns. Uh, the uh, participation in Team Telecom, frankly, has been very uneven. Uh, and the, the most active agency, in my view, has actually been the FBI. Next question. This gentleman here. Hi, thank you. Brent Score at Mercatus Center. I was wondering, uh, for both of you, uh, you know, we're talking about resistance to modernizing the FCC. Is there resistance at the agency? Is that a dominant uh, feeling? Or is there, do you think, a tolerance or appetite for uh, reform, you know, recognizing the Communications Act and the Telecom Act have not aged well, particularly in the last 20 years? Um, so I'd like your, your view. And particularly yours, Harold, uh, since you you were there. You know, what, what's the feeling of career staff and also leadership uh, today? You want me to go first? Oh, go ahead. Uh, um, let me try to bifurcate the question, or the answer, if not the question, which is to say, um, efforts to modernize the statute, uh, which happens just about every year. People try to, well, let's rewrite the Communications Act. Um, candidly, I, I just have never seen any likelihood of that happening. Uh, there's just not the, um, the unusual set of circumstances all happening at the same time that led to the 96 Act. There's nothing remotely similar to that. Um, that isn't to say there aren't members of Congress who every year draft legislation to, to rewrite the Communications Act. I just, I haven't sensed a great tidal wave of support to do that, much less the tidal wave of uh, some uh, 
idea of, of exactly how all of the, the different views uh, of that go together, because there are starkly different views on Capitol Hill about if you were to rewrite the Communications Act, what would a new rewrite be? Separate from the statutory side is inside the agency, is there a view that um, the FCC could be dramatically updated, modernized, if you will? Um, and I think Rosalind is on to a really very interesting idea here that um, um, Bill Kennard uh, actually talked a lot about modernizing the FCC and, and doing different things with it. It was a very, very different time in the 1990s. Um, and I, I think a lot of these ideas were not as um, partisan as they are now. Uh, and I think you had people on each side of the aisle who could take dramatically different views. Uh, you'd have Democrats who were on, and Republicans on one side of the issue of modernizing the FCC and vice versa. Um, and um, it, it, I have gotten the sense that things have ossified in, in recent years. Um, uh, and that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, I think Chairman Pai is, is, uh, is trying to come up with a, a different vision for the FCC, particularly with respect to economists. And you're, you've got two economists sitting up here, so needless to say, the economists are very thrilled about the idea of up, updating uh, the role of economists at the FCC. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the FCC is a creature of statute. It, it does what the statute tells it to do. Uh, people may have different views about exactly what that is. Um, but the FCC by itself cannot follow the, the Danish example of putting itself out of business. That's it's a decision for Congress to make. Uh, and it, it's just it's hard to see that happening anytime soon from a congressional point of view. But I think the, the example of, of Denmark, um, widely viewed as one of the most socialist countries in the world. And th this is not the libertarian paradise. And yet Denmark can operate just fine without an FCC, without the equivalent of an FCC. Uh, to me, that's extraordinary. To me, that is, uh, it begs the question of uh, exactly what type of organization is needed. And um, it's, it's, it's not clear that what we're doing is necessarily the most efficient thing. That's a very long-winded answer, and I'm sure Rosalind will give you a better, and better answer. Well, but Brett, thank you for the question. I know you, you think quite deeply about these things. The other model we have is, you know, if you look at the Netherlands, they merged their telecom authority into their consumer authority. You know, so there's other, you know, there's an, not that I'm saying I would recommend that model, but there's also a case of these, mm -hmm. we, we have these converged regulators um, uh, uh, going on. But it's an interesting point. I, I would, unfortunately, I have to agree with Harold around the political side, because there are parties today who are already planning for you know, when it switches again the other way, that we'll rebuild the FCC and we'll go back to, you know, building a national network and, and you know, they're working on those plans right now. Um, the, the other thing that has happened, for better or worse, in the last 20 years or so, we've had the professionalization of, of um, how would you say, advocacy. I mean, you can get a master's degree in being an activist and there are so many organizations who are their livelihood is based on, you know, essentially lobbying the F FCC. And there is a whole set of funders associated with that. And we have, you know, people, they go to school to learn how to do it. So there's, it's captured not just by industry, but by this larger kind of policy community that has so many ways to pick apart 
um, statutes that can be interpreted, and then you just figure out, well, how do I, you know, t I'm going to make this argument. We'll see if it stands up. So, so there's an, a lot of forces against um, modernizing. I don't. I have not given up hope altogether because I still think that there's enough people who are voters who actually have to. They live in a world where accounting matters, where you know benefit, revenue has to exceed expenses, where at the they have to have a basic level of. What, what do you get out for what you put in? I mean, if you consider the employees of the FCC today, the, the average overhead is $250,000. Okay, that's more than most American families make. And I'm not, I think that they're all hardworking, wonderful people, but you have to say to yourself, is this the best model? Is this the best use of our you know, limited resources? We have a $4 trillion uh, government you know, are we getting four trillion dollars of benefit out of it? And you know, look at the wonderful Mercatus studies that show if we had froze our regulatory state, our economy would be you know twenty five percent larger than it is today. Um, so, so those are the. I mean, I still think that there's room for us to have that discussion around the big picture, that that and that we aren't so prey to oh, you know, the government can fix it for us and that they know better, and you know that there's just the one thing I, I pray for is in this small period of time that we have rolled back the open internet order. Chairman Pai has done amazing work to bring transparency and accountability to the FCC. Just a side note, a journalist said to me, he said, I am so happy that the FCC does this transparency because before I had no idea it was, it was in the item. My job is so much easier because three weeks before every meeting, I know what they're going to talk about. I can write my stories so much easier. I don't have to go around and ask someone who's in, you know. So look at the journalists who have now have a much easier job of reporting what the agency actually does. But in any case, um, we have a small runway here to actually show that the reforms that the FCC's made in terms of rolling back a misguided order that actually can stimulate some of the, uh, what, what we believe, some of the um, uh, entre enterprise that wanted to go on, that we'll see, we're seeing 5G come online, so that for ordinary people can just say, well, well, the market actually works, you know, or it works good enough that I'm willing to go with it. So, I mean, that is, a, that is an opportunity that we have right now. And, and I think if, if you consider in the last year, the FCC did 78 items on 30 distinct issues of telecom policy, two-thirds of which were, uh, were by bipartisan voting, it's just one-third were dissent. So you know, that doesn't get coverage in the media, but the, the big point is there, there are things going on. And, and um, you know, the Office of, of uh, Economics and Analytics is a great step, most important thing and maybe in 20 years in terms of reform. But there's a lot of other things that matter, the process reform that has gone on, um, trying to streamline the reporting requirements. So um, they're taking, a, they're taking an in, a, a positive incremental approach to, to, to doing things around the edges that matter. Rosalind, you mentioned the Netherlands is having combined consumer protection and telecommunications. Are there other countries that have been particularly innovative in addition to Denmark and the Netherlands? Well, Ofcom is one model. Um, they are, a, an, it's an interesting example. Um, it's very economist heavy, as you know. And they produce a number of authoritative studies. Uh, they have one on traffic management. So this is, with the Brexit going on, a lot of people in the EU, they're really sad because Ofcom isn't at the table in the same way anymore because they were the voice of reason <laughs> in a lot of cases where the EU was going off the cliff you yeah. know, with so many crazy things. And Ofcom was always pulling them back because they were so grounded in the... Um, but, but the interesting thing is, given the... Um, there are so many regulatory agencies, broadcast and utilities, and if you, if you study this around the world, there's all kinds of convergences coming together. It is messy because it doesn't always, it's not like a merger and acquisition where so, things can instantly go away and you can divest. So there will be overlapping authorities. There's sort of things left on the table. So it doesn't go as seamless as it does in the private sector. But it's sort of, the lesson learned is, if you are charged with making any new kind of agency, you better <laughs> have a plan. You should have a sunset plan at the beginning, because when these things are set up, they're very hard to dismantle and reform 
and and they they live on forever. You know, it, it's it's yeah. rare. I mean, I will say Denmark did a very good job of the um, of making it clean, and they did it fast, and that's just the nature of their you know their society. But most of the cases, um, it's messy. Um, you know, it, it's a kind of a it's like a zombie. It doesn't ever die. <laughs> Take one more question here, this gentleman. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti. Um, I work with private equity in the technology sector. And my question is similar to ones you've been addressing, but it raises it's raised to a level of abstraction, maybe a couple of steps higher. And that is, if you had to do it all over again, if you were the Martian coming down taking charge of these humans or reorganizing everything after the zombie ap apocalypse and you had to figure out how to do this, the Telecom Act and the FCC regulations would look nothing at all like what they look like today. In fact, this whole Title II classification issue is really just one example of a long list of things where the Internet really doesn't fit cable TV bucket, it doesn't fit telephone bucket, it doesn't fit any bucket. And we're pretty much at the point today where the largest publisher in our country is the internet. The largest television network in our country is the internet. The largest telephone system in our country is the internet. The largest banking system, the largest educational. So you would probably have Title I interconnected data networks and Title II everything else. I mean, who knows? But how would, if you weren't constrained by all of the political and legal constraints that exist today, how would you restructure the whole area, recognizing that interconnected data networks are sort of swallowing everything, and what would it, what would it look like? Well, I go back to the 1920s, you know, with the Federal Radio Commission, and it was interesting when the first, you know, people started their own radio stations and, and whatnot, you know, creating the FCC was really a bipartisan power grab, if you will. I mean, both parties saw this need to sort of control this wonderful new ed of innovation. And um, so I would go back to that moment in time, and I would bring my, you know, 2018 technical solutions to the moment and sort of say, OK, there, you know, we have a wonderful innovation for how we can manage the spectrum. So if I had to impose one thing today, I'd put a licensing authority in place of the FCC. You know, I would do. And, and anything that would fell, fall on the wayside, I would have picked up by, by the FTC. Um, that would be my fast solution. But I wish we could go back to the 20s. And, and, and you know, it wasn't like the, the knowledge didn't exist in those days, but it was an extremely politicized moment that the, both parties felt an opportunity to manage the airwaves to their political benefit. And tons of you know, private radio stations, they were all not private, but, you know, people were put out of business. That happened right at, right at the beginning. What, what, what would you license out of the spectrum? Anything else? That's a great question. Yeah, that, that's all that comes to my mind that needs to be licensed. I mean, there's so many, and I would do this with every agency. I'd go to NOAA, you know, and look at all the weather. I would have all their stuff be put out to bid. I mean, I'd bring that same concept of, okay, today our prevailing technology is this. You need to show me why... Um, why you can't have a private sector do this better than you. You have to justify to me why you have to stay in business. Or, I might, this might sound a little bit harsh, but it would force them to think through, are we the best, is, are, are we the only agency that can, can get this done, right? We're the center of truth for weather information, for example. And with that, please join me in thanking Carlson Layton. <laughs>